Hopefully this is going to be a nice relaxed conversation because I don't have Should like be? a fancy outline or any kind of, I mean, I jotted a couple of things down, but that'd be good. Nothing super intense. Or I should say formal, not super formal. It's <laughs> going to be intense. So it'll be formal. Uh, oh yeah, that's right. We're recording. Both recording or just you? Now I'm not sure. Does it say okay. recording at the top of yours? Yes, but then I also want to record it. Oh, okay. Okay, good. There we go. Okay, now we're both recording. I'm recording you and you're recording me. Yeah. I wish I had uh, dressed better because you're going to put yours on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay because it's the message more than the, the vessel, right? Yeah, I could never figure out how to get my, well, my background drops don't work, but I don't have my green screen up. So uh, anyway, thanks for coming back on the podcast. You're welcome. You know, it has been three years. Almost. No way. Yeah, because it was, it was like January or February of 2020. Okay, because I know that, so was it before I, it was before that I went to Michigan then, because I've been here almost two years. Yeah, because we, yeah, we did, did the podcast and then, yeah, and then you came in okay. that June, right? Wow, Weren't you here June 2020? Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's amazing. Wow. Maybe it was 21. No, I, I know, I've gotten, I've lost track of everything. No, 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 it had to have been 21. When I moved there, I got COVID in December of 2020. Okay, and so then me try, and try and left for Wyoming in January of 21. So I got to, so it might have been in, no, no, that would, it might have been. I don't know when I, I know when I got to Michigan it was in 21. All right, so then two years, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. Time flies when you're having fun. I know. So I'm starting, I'm going to do this series on spiritual abuse in the church. I mean, I guess there could be spiritual abuse outside the church, but that it seems like they kind of go together. Right. Can, can you have spiritual abuse not uh, associated with the church? I don't know. Um, and so a couple of things I want to talk about since this is kind of your bailiwick is so I want to I want to do a little bit of defining terminology. Like I I feel like there's two things that we see a lot of. One, we see a lot of people who throw around terminology. So should and, we so should we record this while you're doing this, or are we going to practice it? Because if I try, if you try to get me to say it twice, it's not going to be as fun. Asking you the question for real. <laughs> Already, <laughs> are you gonna edit all this? Out? Sorry. Usually, you say "ready, set, go." Oh, wait! I should drink coffee and then say "ready, set, go." Okay. <laughs> Again, um, as I'm starting this series on spiritual abuse, like uh, I've seen a couple of things. One, I've seen people use. Um, terminology like gaslighting, narcissism, stuff like that. And they just kind of throw those words around. And sometimes, maybe a lot of times, the things they're talking about, it really doesn't apply. Like it's maybe an over-exaggeration or they're they're mis mishandling or misusing the word. But then I also see um, the other side where people will point out or identify abuse and they're like, and other people will be like, that's not, that's not abuse. Right. Like, um, which are obviously is a form of gaslighting, but, <laughs> uh, you know, and, and I think it's this for some people, if you're not, if it's not sexual in nature, or if it doesn't leave a mark, you know, then it's not abuse. And so, uh, so I, I kind of I want to talk about that, those two ideas, those two concepts, and then the other one I want to talk about because, you know, deconstruction is really the hot topic 
and, and I don't necessarily want to talk about deconstruction as much as I want the idea of a lot of people are deconstructing and leaving the church because of abuse. And I, I think it would be good for you, maybe if you would share your story on how did you process through that without necessarily abandoning your faith? Because I see it's just a lot of people abandoning their faith in, in Christ um, because of the church, which I understand that. Um, so how, how do we do that? Like, how do we process that? And then not, not only stay with Christ, but also stay connected to the body of Christ. Um, because I, what I hear a lot of people is saying, oh, well, I like Christ. I just don't like the church. Right. Right. I hear that. So, yeah, yeah. So let's uh, let's start with the terminology first. Will you talk a little bit about narcissist narcissism, which I think is different, if I understand it correctly, from narcissistic personality disorder? Is that true? Yes, there is a difference, um, but it's very nuanced. And I think for people just in general to understand narcissism itself. Um, is is helpful because people will say oh they're just narcissistic and they, like you said they throw the word around and they don't really know what it means and there's you know some specifics about what it means to be narcissistic and several traits um, of you know grandiosity and this sort of thing um just because somebody's a jerk to you doesn't mean that they're not necessarily narcissistic they might just be in that moment having an, an issue about whatever topic you brought up the interesting thing, um, and this is a side note, I suppose, to some degree, that narcissists typically have the lowest self-esteem of anybody, and people t- don't believe that often. They don't believe that because they come across as so grandiose that they know everything, they're, they're prolific liars, and they always have to be the biggest, the best. But the reason why they do that is because they have chronic low self-esteem, and their self-esteem is so um, fragile that they have to maintain this facade of greatness because if they were found out, it would be so painful that they couldn't cope with it. So there's this necessity of presenting to other people um, to be perfect, bigger, better, faster. They have to put other people down in order to keep themselves elevated because they're too fragile um, to handle any more negativity. So oftentimes they've been abused and uh, they won't even want to talk about it. They'll, they'll say, oh yeah, that didn't matter to me. And that's why narcissists are, are notorious for not seeking treatment and not accepting help when they do seek treatment. So um, hopefully that understands a little bit behind the doors of the mind of a narcissist. I think so. I think it does. And uh, you know, I like that you pointed out somebody can just be having a bad moment or they could just be, you know, um, visually, you know, a jerk, right? right? Um, which doesn't necessarily mean that there's a narcissist, that they are nurse, a narcissist or narcissistic. Um, so could you, I don't know, I get, I know you, you mentioned a little bit about the grandiose, like, what does that kind of look like? Well, that would be that somebody comes in and they're the life of the party. They instantly walk into the room and they want all the attention. So they're the loudest in the room, um, they have the most fem- flamboyant clothing in the room, or they notice that they'll make note of other people's um, attire and note that theirs is a higher brand um, or a better color. Um, they'll have brought the biggest gift. And it, it just the presentation of self is grand, is very everything is grand and 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 attributed to perfectionism. And if there's if there's something that's off, they'll lie about it and it, it, it everybody else in the room will see what's true but the narcissist has to believe the lie in order for them to maintain their sense of self that's where the mental health issue comes in that they'll lie about things easily because of the need to maintain their sense of self that's interesting now um I also hear the term gaslighting a lot. Now, gaslighting, is that unique to narcissism or can any, is that, so gaslighting is a tool for anybody who maybe who's abusive. 
or maybe for anybody. If you're gaslighting somebody, you are abusive. So yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, I don't want to promote gaslighting as a tool to be used for those of you who are <laughs> abusive. Here's an option. Now, um, so the, the reality of gaslighting is making somebody feel crazy, basically calling um, the, the truth a lie or a lie of the truth and looking them in the eye and saying something that causes them to feel that they're crazy. And this is um, most notably, as we were discussing this topic, a specific book came to mind where in the book, that uh, in a relationship between a husband and spouse, which can be correlated again with any relationship, um, the husband will say, um, you can go ahead and tell people and, um, but he'll say, what do you, what do you, what are you trying to do? You know, are you trying to break me down? And other people will say, well, he's so friendly and so kind and, and so nice. Why, why are you trying to destroy him? And he'll make you feel crazy because nobody else sees the truth. Only you see the truth and they all see the lie and it makes you feel crazy. It makes you second guess what you see and what you believe. And that's what true gaslighting is. Okay. Um, okay because that is interesting right like because I have had these conversations about people um where I have said you know that person just makes me crazy how come nobody else sees it like and I and so I guess I wonder like how do you how do you get around that like how because it, it like you know I like my question is is like the the other person saying well, aren't they, aren't they, like, I've, I've had people who have been like pointing at each other going, no, they're the crazy one. <laughs> like, I don't know who's the crazy one. Maybe you're both crazy. <laughs> right. Like, I guess, how, how do you, how do you figure out the truth about, about that? Well, it, if you're a victim of gaslighting, you know, the truth and the challenges. Um, and I would say as a, as a, as an easy out journal, journal what is true and, and continue to journal what is true. If you're in a relationship that's that unhealthy that you can't get out of, then um, journaling what is true and, and noting that other people do not see what you see. And, and so that other people are going to have a perception that is false. So like you said about my own childhood, my parents were abusive and um, nobody ever saw that. They were the most giving people. They tithed regularly. They were in the church. They did everything. And, and when my dad went to jail, they, I had somebody say to me, how come your parents aren't here when my children were in a Christmas play? And I said, well, and, and they knew what had happened and they, they knew everything. And they said, how come your parents aren't here? And I said, well, I don't have a really great relationship with my parents. They go, well, that doesn't matter. They should be able to be here. And I'm looking at them going, I know they know. And I thought, and so I said, well, if my, if my dad is within a hundred yards of my children, I lose custody immediately. Does that clarify it for you? And then I turned around and walked away <laughs> because there's just some people that the, that they want to see something in particular and that they, the truth is too hard for them to believe. And that person wasn't necessarily narcissistic, but they were just so, so convinced that, that the, what they saw with their own eyes was the truth even though the law had intervened on this completely other dynamic level, it was, it was really hard for them to understand that. Okay. That makes a little bit more sense because what they saw, right? Like um, I have a clergy friend mentor who lost their credentials not too long ago uh, for abuse. Um, and all I only knew this person in one setting and like it blew me away. I mean, I, I like I'm still going. I mean, I'm not I'm not dismissing um the person that he abused, but I am it's what they call the, cognitive dissonance. Like like yeah, there you go. Two, these two things that you can't equate, they don't they can't exist together in your mind just because of what you've experienced for so long and you've believed it for so long and seen it this way for so long, this new information comes in and it's like, it doesn't correlate with your personal experience and it makes it extremely challenging. Absolutely. 
Well, okay, so I'm glad that you put a word <laughs> I, mental anguish, <laughs> cognitive dissonance. All right, I will look that up. I will <laughs> put something in the show notes, I'm sure. So, um, so I know we've we've done those two terms, but I want to talk also about verbal abuse. Can we talk about that? Because I feel like people, obviously, sexual abuse, they get that and they get physical abuse. But I feel like there's still, even in our culture, the idea of verbal abuse um, or emotional abuse is really, um, people just don't understand it. Uh, cause you know, cause you think about what well, everybody has a bad day, right? Everybody gets stressed out, whatever, whatever. Um, but it does have a pattern. So will you speak to that? Like what exactly is it? What, what is it that we identify as the pattern? So, um, I'll, we have to dig a little bit deeper into your in your understanding of the pattern, but verbal abuse. It's interesting as a licensed therapist in the state of California, they I, there's a common knowledge. It's like don't even report emotional abuse because no one's going to do anything about it. It's hard to prove. It's it's it doesn't hold up well in in the um, courts, which is you know a sad a sad state of affairs. And when you talk about verbal abuse, and that's where the whole identity abuse, you know, when you have verbal abuse, it jacks up your identity, right? If somebody's telling you things about yourself, that's abusive. And, and that can be anything that's demeaning or a lie. So if you're telling somebody a lie, that's going to impact their future in any way, that's abusive. And I had a relationship one time where there was just chronic um, insufficiency. This isn't good enough. That's not good enough. And it was, but it was chronic, which means it just goes on forever and ever and ever and ever. And there was never a point of sufficiency. And that's abusive because there's, there's no reprieve of any kind to say, oh, okay, I'm, I'm improving and I've, and I've done better and now I'm doing okay. And it's, and it's just a constant belittling of your capacity as a human. Um, and then, it, and then there's the outright, you know, attack where somebody's genuinely saying something hyper negative to you directly to your face that that is abusive because it's a trauma it actually triggers a trauma response in your body but because the trauma response in your body is not as visibly seen as you know bruises on your face then it's harder for other people to recognize and then respond to it but where if you go show up to work with bruises on your face people are going to say wow what happened and and you have something to talk about but if you show up and you're just heart hurt nobody's going to notice it. And if you say, yeah, we can go so well, you don't even know how to talk about it. There's no verbiage in our culture to really talk about what does emotional abuse uh, do to us? How does it feel? How does it play out in life? How do we handle it when somebody tells us that, about it? it? Makes it really tricky. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You don't really know how to talk about it, do you? Mm -hmm. Um and so can we take these and apply them in the church? I mean, obviously the church is filled with people or is filled, with, you know, broken people. Um, and, you know, I think that there's a certain amount of, I don't want to say people expect it from the people in the pews, but it's, you do. I mean, you know that there's, you, hopefully you know that there's people there who are you know broken and and searching and at different places in their walk with Christ um but then there are those who are in the church who are leaders um or clergy which automatically makes you a leader um who you know have these tendencies and these um character flaws I don't know what we want what we want to call them but mental and, health issues. Yeah. And, and, it, and I was sitting here kind of jotting some of these down that, that you have people who use the church to manipulate others. I mean, they genuinely are using the church to manipulate others. They know what they're doing and that's what they're doing. And then there's other people who, who are emotionally ill and they, they, they thrive on the church environment to make themselves feel better. And, and I don't know that they're consciously doing it, 
but their their mental illness is playing out in the construct of church and um i, I read a book called well-intentioned dragons well-intentioned dragons and it was given to me by a pastor and i thought oh okay so i looked at, I, I found myself between the pages and then I gave it to a friend who got angry and said, I'm not a well-intentioned dragon, <laughs> which kind of implies the fact that she was a well-intentioned dragon. But the point being that people can be very well-intentioned in the church and hurt other people um, unknowingly because they're, I use ignorant in a, in a honest way where they just don't know. They really don't know. And for me, I have a very analytical brain and I would always be like, well, we had to try this. We had to do that. How can we do it, do it this way? And we had to try this. And, and, it, and it was rather than experiencing church for what it was intended, I was always trying to fix it and um, improve it, which isn't a bad thing in and of itself. But when it's superimposed on my own spiritual growth, then um, it detracts from the whole intention of church. And I think if people, uh, you and I included, thought about a church that we walked into every Sunday full of people exactly like us with the same sins that we've been through with the same amount of forgiveness or unforgiveness that we're dealing with in our lives. And everybody else in that building was just like us. We would have more grace and sadly, and I believe this is my whole heart. We have created a culture of perfectionism where once you become a Christian and you've been a Christian for maybe a year or so, you're supposed to be able to behave in this like professional stance of a Christian. You've got it all down. You're doing your Bible studies. You're showing up to Sunday school. You're cleaning up your, your mouth. You're doing less, you know, things out in the world. And, but we don't talk about it anymore. We talk about it like when you're first a Christian and we talk about all the things that we've recovered from and we're doing, and then you stop. And then we, we perform church. And because of that culture, there's this expectation that we place on ourselves to live up to. And then we also then place those expectations on those around us. And when they fail, um, we just don't know how to handle that well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, yeah. <clears throat> okay. So let's talk about this we've ex so we've experienced or, or somebody had i mean you have i know but um and i'm sure there's others who are listening who've experienced abuse with and i'm just going to use the phrase within the church so maybe it's a parent um or another family member who identified as a christian maybe it's actually somebody within within the congregation like a pastor or another leader a sunday school teacher etc um, who views them in some way. Maybe it's sexual, maybe it's physical, maybe it's verbal. Um, and, you know, they finally come to a place where, you know, they're speaking up or maybe they brought a lot, sometimes a lot of time too, which I have some people in my congregation who they brought this, uh, that they confess that they had been abused to their pastor and their pastors, you know, basically told them it was their fault. Right. So, once you decide you, that you want to do something about it, um, a lot of times they begin wrestling with God and their faith and the church and those things. And well, oftentimes, maybe they'll either leave their faith altogether and leave the church, or they'll leave the church and say, I'm just going to do Jesus, but they're going to, you know, they're going to leave the church, um, which I will just say sounds really good right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, it's been, it's, it's been yeah, a and it's couple of stressful it's years. Okay. It's totally understandable why people do that. That needs to be noted. Absolutely. And I think for, for myself, um, I was adopted as a baby and the people who adopted me, um, I was sexually molested and they were both emotionally devoid of capacity of any kind of being parents and uh, both physically abusive as well. However, my mom played the organ at the church. We were raised in private school. We were at church all the time. And my dad was on the church board and taught the junior high Sunday school class. Surprise and got arrested for molesting somebody else in the church as well. And, and so there's variations of, of abuse when you talk about, um, so I, let me retract a little bit, back up a little bit. Um, I believe that the reason why I'm strong in my faith is because I was raised around the church. It was part of my culture, my upbringing. 
Um, it was a norm in, our, in my era that people went to church on Sundays. And if you didn't, you were just like a bad sinner, right? That was just kind of like the philosophy that I was raised with. So being a part of the church and it being part of my life had been normal, even all the way through that, that process. But that's different than my faith, where I came to the Lord, I saw that there was, there was some validity in the whole Bible, having a relationship with God was something that was real. And that understanding that the church systemically was broken, it wasn't necessarily the people that were broken, there might be broken people in there that are, you know, messing it up. But people would rag on me all the time. Why haven't you left? Why do you stay with it? Especially during the emergent era. Um, people were complaining all the time. Look at what you've been through. Why do you stay with it? And I said, I would rather help fix a broken system than stand back and judge it. So that's a little bit about, about really my processing there. Um, and it's been my relationship with God and the intimacy of that relationship and what I, what I've personally experienced with him that makes me know that I cannot deny his existence or his love for me. Um, I did have another experience later on in life where um, somebody had confessed to me that their parent who was in the hierarchy of the church um, had done sexually um, um, abused them and some other stuff. And I had reported it to their superior and kind of was just waiting, you know, for something to happen. And it was make it was nerve wracking waiting, you know, the waiting week after week. And I finally called that superior back and said, so I was just curious what's going to happen. And he said, what business is of it yours? And that is an a, a abuse of a whole nother kind. And those types of abuses are not labeled well. And and yet I knew that that was their problem. They were wrestling with how do we deal with this thing? And I ended up leaving the, the church um, and going to a different church, but I didn't ever, I mean, there was a time where I, I felt like the church was so focused on the wrong things that I wanted to leave the church and, and, and just ditch the whole thing because it's like, this is just a, a, an energetic waste of time. And coming back to God, coming back to my faith, coming back to my call to ministry and saying what I learned about God that day that I said that sin, simple sinner's prayer was that there is a creator God that loves me infinitely. And that the change that happened in my life that day, I could afford that to other people if I helped the system progress. And and I didn't want to let other people down by not following through with that because it was, it was so important to me and, and made, made a difference, even though I still struggled with so many things that, that occurred inside of it, I couldn't deny the impact that it had on me. And so that's why I've kind of stuck with it all this time. Okay. Well, uh, I'm glad you're still here. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, glad you're still stuck around. I'm, glad, I'm glad you're still here too. <laughs> Advice for people who, um, well, this is, you know, most of the people who listen to this are clergy, although I do have some lay people too. So maybe some advice for clergy who are watching some of this happen and trying to figure out, do I stay? Do I go? Do I go to another denomination, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then maybe for lay people who have experienced it and they're like, I really love Jesus, but I just don't know about the church anymore. Right. And, and so to address the people first, um, I was thinking about this before we started chatting about the fact that there might be um, people who are broken, um, but that doesn't mean that we apply that to all people in the church, that because we know there are some people who, who are misrepresenting God or are not surrendered to God doesn't mean that everybody is like that. And, and to find those who, it was, when I first got saved, my pastor said, find, find a mentor. Everybody needs a mentor. Who do you pick? And I remember this little old lady with white hair. And, and I thought she was the most saintly person on the planet. And I said, I pick her. And she's been my friend ever since then. So she's, so I'm 58 and she, I was 22 that when I got saved and we've been friends all that time, pick somebody who, you know, you can trust and walk that journey with them. 
and don't depend on perfectionism inside the church to create the stability in your walk. Um, and when it comes to clergy, I think the hardest part that clergy struggle with in these is boundaries. You know, how do we create boundaries and where do we draw the line and when do we say enough is enough? And when do we say we're not going to allow that here um, and not waiting too long? I think that's the thing that I see the most frequently is that clergy wait too long to handle a situation because of their fear of the fallout. And it's better to have a small church that's healthy than a large church that's dysfunctional. A great point. You're, you're the, I mean, obviously boundaries, but um, the reality is that we do wait too long. And there's, there's that struggle, right? Because there's a part of you that says, I mean, as clergy, I should be willing to extend grace upon grace upon grace, right? But then you have, it's, it's that balance of trying to figure out at what point are we harming the rest of the body by not, you know, holding right. people accountable. And, and, and in my training as a therapist, one of the things that we were trained to do was always err on the side of the child. So when it came to reporting abuse of any kind, they said err on the side of the child. And it's always better to err on the side of the innocent and be wrong than it is to um, to not act and and see the fallout of that. Because when you talk about spiritual abuse, the long long term impact of that um, can obviously be eternal but generational as well. Okay. Um, you know, one of obviously, obviously there's a lot of, over the last two, three years, a lot of stuff that's come out um, from Ravi Zacharias to um, Darren Patrick, I think he uh, was caught in abuse and took his own life. Um, we got Carl Lentz, we got, the whole Hillsong thing. Uh, then you have the whole SBC scandal at <laughs> Baptist Conference. And they're whatever, 127 pages or whatever it was. I, I can't remember now. But um, and I, so I think there's a certain amount where just in general, the church, the cl clergy of the church, um, leaders in the church are just overwhelmed. And trying to keep their eyes fixed on Jesus and the light, the light, this little town, it, it seems, I know that this says that the darkness cannot uh, overcome it, but it does feel like it's getting really dim. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And it, and it is, yeah. you know, when you think about those larger system churches and, and the freedom that people had to do things, you'll hear after the reports come out that people will say, well, I always was wondering about this. And I was, and, and they were afraid to say something due to the superiority of the person that was at fault. And we have to remember that we're human. And it, and it says that if we see as someone sinning and we don't turn a sinner from the error of his ways, we're going to be held accountable. And to, to say, we're supposed to offer grace, but that's why we were given that accountability protocol in the scripture as well. You know, you go to them and if they don't listen to you, bring some with you and, and you exercise the protocol rather than waiting too long. And then the whole thing blows up and falls apart. And yeah, I mean, the, 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 it's the waiting issue and realizing, I think, you know, we talk about our gut and, and we, you know, we're not supposed to, we're not supposed to follow our gut, but biologically god created us in a way to create community we're, we're literally created for community and when something is a, a hazard to the community biologically there might be something that's saying hey there's a hazard here maybe we should address it and that's not gossip it's simply facts i'm noticing something that seems odd to me can you help me understand it and 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 then pray about it and listen to that and and just be realistic about it um that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, that's good advice. I, I think so. I mean, obviously, we know we have to pray about it. But um, I, I think it's, it is good to talk about these things and with, you know, a couple of other clergy or other friends that um, we can trust and say, man, this this looks something doesn't seem right, something seems off. Um, and maybe 
uh, if nothing else, maybe we need uh, a small group of friends that we can say, you know, if I come and say to you, something seems off, I want you to hear me, <laughs> you know, are you hearing me? Not, I'm going to dismiss you <laughs> and say, and, oh, it's, yeah, it's like a, you. It's a super great point. I have told people, I have friends that I will call them and I will say, I'm going to vent and I need you to say, wow, that sounds really hard. Okay. And they say, okay. And then I vent. And when I'm done, they say, wow, that sounds really hard. And I say, it is. Thank you for listening. It's okay for you to prep people like that and tell them there's going to be times in my life when I'm going to need you to do X for me in order for me to be able to process some of what I'm going through. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. And when we talk about, you know, those safe spaces, um, I've been, I was actually right before we got, we started chatting, I was chatting with somebody else about um, a virtual reality room where people in leadership could go and be in an avatar that looks nothing like them with a name that's nothing like theirs and be able to speak openly about what it's like to be them and the things that they're going through. Um, yeah, and you know, that's kind of why the masterclass was built that I run because there needs to be those places where people can be authentic and talk about what it's like to be them, even just themselves without talking about all the church drama on top of it, especially if you're in leadership. There's very few places where people feel safe in any kind of group platform to be able to have those conversations. Seems kind of fun, that avatar thing. Is that for real or are you just, that was your idea? I'm in the process of creating it, yeah. All right. I want some really wild clothing to wear for my avatar. Well, I was uh, the conversation was the person that ran the Bible study that I went to last uh, was a beagle. <laughs> And he ran the, he ran the overhead and not the overhead, but the, you know, the music um, videos and sat down and opened up his Bible and read the first five chapters of John and just a little dog. It was a dog. Yeah. A little beagle. All right. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Cindy Lopper. <laughs> now, now everybody will know. They'll be like, oh, that must be, that must be Joanne. Cindy Lopper. <laughs> That's funny. Share about this topic? Um, I, I really think that authenticity is the way to go with when you're struggling with this. If, if you're having that happen to you, you need to make sure you tell somebody. And, and if it has to be somebody outside your immediate circles, then that's, that's okay. You have to do that. And, and it's sad that we have to do that, but sometimes that's where we have to go to have somebody listen to us and give us practical, realistic advice. If we're too tied into the system that's broken and we're only going to people inside the system to, to deal with it, sometimes that, that creates that unhealthiness. And if um, you're seeing somebody else have this happen to them and you're not sure what to do, then you need to talk to other people who are in your position in other locations and even again outside of your um tribe, I know that's a bad word these days, but um, to find out what do they do in these instances? How do they handle it? And and get some external advice. Um, and, you know, I, I think the issue is what happens to me if I tell on somebody? What happens to them and then what happens to me? And that's why we always err on the side of the victim. And it's always better to err on the side of the victim and have to go look for a new job and know that we save somebody from from abuse than it is to keep our job and watch them go through something like that. It's true. I don't like it, but somebody has to defend the right. defenseless, right? Well, when I used to have to turn in people for um, child abuse, I would cry. Every time I had to call child protective services, I would cry because I hated doing it because I knew what it was going to do to me and them and their family, and it was going to blow stuff up, and you didn't know what the end result was going to be. It was very hard to do, and I'm not trying to minimize that at all. It's just that we have to do it. We genuinely have to do it. Thank you so much for all of this. I'm going to stop the recording now. <laughs>